Good evening. This is Literary Exchanges, moderated by, I'll repeat. Good evening, this is Literary Exchanges, moderated by Mark Vella. A conversation between Emmanuel Mifsud and Irvine Welsh. everyone thank you for attending and obviously thanks to the national book festival for having organized all this for having thought of this encounter between Emmanuel Mifsud and Irvin Welsh who although coming from different geographical cultural contexts have some uncanny commonalities similarities as we hope to discuss uh, tonight we've got a more intimate setting than yesterday but I guess there's a more discerning audience since today we're going to do a literary <laughs> exchange, even from looking at the faces in the audience. Uh, we're going to talk about essentially, you know, literature, compare works and compare the author's vision. Um, obviously, the unlikely connection is due to um, some context, which I was talking to Irvin about just a few minutes ago, that just after transporting the novel and the movie, and what was happening in the mostly in the UK with the young British artists, Britpop, you know, Blairite Britain, and so on. Um, at the beginning of, of the century, there was a, maybe a mini Renaissance in Maltese literature, which is which probably laid the seeds for what's happening now. And Emmanuel was one of the foremost authors to have participated in this uh, Renaissance in a way. And you were one of the people we used to look up to as far as style is concerned, image, and all that. So first of all, I'd like to ask you, did this ever happen to you? I mean, you've been around the world on similar events that a national literature tells you, hey, we owe you a debt, or a group of writers say you are our beacon, our guru. No, it's usually the reverse. Uh, they tell you to get out of town um, as quickly as possible. Uh, it's... Um, it's quite strange. I mean, what, what usually happens is that I'll go to some festival or book fair and um, I'll, end up, uh, I'll end up kind of uh, in some seedy bar with uh, a bunch of underground writers who weren't invited to the festival who'll tell me, yeah, you're the boy, but the official festival, usually it's like, um, no, you know what I mean? But so. It must, I must be getting older, basically. You know, it's a good, it's a sure sign that I'm kind of um, maturing when uh, there's that sort of uh, feel about it, you know. But so it's incredibly flattering. And um, the thing is that you never really know yourself yeah. what kind of influence that your, your stuff has, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I'm trying to compete with the, with the noise. So I might be just looking at you blankly, you know, sometimes. The, the thing is, if we shout louder, yes, they'll shout right. louder we'll as well. We'll drown out these guys. Yes. <laughs> and then we'll just have this mad noise. Which Maybe is if the fun. audio could just... Yeah. Uh, Emmanuel, I mean, you were part of this mini renaissance and I, I published you, your own, and all that. You know, the story is known. You published your first book with me. Um, we used to talk about Nile Griffith, we used to talk about Irvin, we used to look at what's happening out there and with our look at the Anglo-American world, although there were other influences. When Simona called me to organize this thing, it took me years back to what seems like a distant past now. Uh, what emotions, thoughts does this event, you know, does this encounter with Irvin Welsh uh, conjure, you know, right now in your mind and in your particular uh, stage of your career right now? Well, I think it was a, it was a, a phase which... Mm -hmm. Is it okay? Uh, 
I was saying it was a phase uh, back back in the in the 90s, which coincided with with other social phenomena which were happening back then. You know, we were <laughs> we were young at that time, and uh, we were quite unhappy with what uh, we were reading from other writers before us. We were disappointed, maybe, that they weren't really going deep enough into what was happening around us. Which you can't really blame them, because they had other preoccupations and they had other issues to, to, to face back then, you know. Uh, as for me, uh, as you know very well, Mark, I'm not a big fan of, of literature from the UK, because as you know, I I look at other places, you know. But when I came across uh, Irvine's and Niles' uh, books, I said, well, these, these, these two guys are talking to me somehow, and I have to, to reply to this and, and respond. Because I saw that there were many, many things which were common between the, what was happening with Mark Renton et al., and many people which you and I uh, had come across uh, in our lives, you know. Yes. So I said, yes, this is something which uh, I can relate to, even though it's coming from a literature I'm not quite a fan of, you know. Yes. Of course, it was a time when even you as a publisher, you know, you, you were inspired by what was happening in the UK. Like, for example, uh, <laughs> changing writers into pop stars, you know, and we used to go to all these very weird TV programs just to, as a means of, you know, to try to, to, to create some kind of uh, PR with, with the wider, wider readership, and it worked, but I think it was cool for a while, but then, as uh, speaking for myself, I said, this is not really my thing, you know, I, I yeah. Ventured. What's common also is that you might have also happened in a, in a transitory period in history. Um, even the stories that you recount span from, well, Thatcherite or post-Thatcherite times, the effect of Thatcherism onto, you know, the cool Britannia pipe dream, you know, and, and onto these days. And in your case, you even chronicled, I guess, that change from uh, more than the 80s, the Labour Party, the troubles, our troubles, you know, and then going on to post 87 when we started forcefully modernizing in a way in order to get into uh, the EU. Uh, what's your take on uh, how history uh, impinges on your work? I mean, obviously you are not historians, you are writers, but there's a, a historical element and a, a particular period which which cannot be denied. Both your writings, you know, cannot be analyzed without looking into what happened in the society you're describing. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, um, it dawned on me quite quickly that uh, I wasn't really writing about youth or writing about drugs. Um, what I was writing about was uh, deindustrialization, was about the, the long term movement into a world without paid work, which we're all undergoing to a greater or lesser extent. And how much of our um, experience in the West has been about um, industry and industrial sort of life with the, the division of labor and um, with, uh, and also imperialism with, uh, with you know, kind of, uh, and the, uh, the decline of these things and the decline of a, a welfare state with the rise of neoliberalism as a, a global phenomenon. Um, I think that uh, what it's done is it's untethered and unrooted uh, characters and unrooted communities. So everything is in this kind of strange flux now and we, we feel very existentially threatened and we feel very devoid of purpose because um, that more structured, stratified um, division of labor, uh, industrial society gave us some kind of place and some kind of status. And now that's all kind of, that's all gone. So we're trying to find ways um, 
of managing that transition. Uh, and it's, you know, it's like the, you know, the transition when you had the transition from feudalism into capitalism. Now we've got this transition from capitalism into conceptualism, into a world where we, we can make everything at zero cost. Um, so theoretically, profits should be falling to zero and wages should be falling to zero. We should, this is a, the epoch of history that we're in. Um, but there's also a sense that um, we as human beings are becoming redundant and making ourselves redundant, both economically and spiritually. And uh, what are we actually doing? You know, and all we're doing now is kind of basically just sending every resource that we have up to the, the very uh, most elite in society, we've kind of we've, we've sat that mechanism, and we're just watching this happen. Um, and uh, it always strikes me that you know when you had the, the 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 move from the medievalism to capitalism, you have a plague that comes, an attendant plague, like you had the Black Death, people being crowded into cities, and now the plague is mainly the plague from capitalism to conceptualism. It's mainly a head thing, it's and it's mainly manifested in drugs, which is a kind of um, it's filling the gap between who we are and who we want to be. So we're trying to find out who we are and we're, we're taking drugs for all sorts of reasons to medicate against the pain of being human, but also to explore the kind of whole psychoactive terrain and what humanity is about and what the future of our humanity is about. So um, I'm trying to, I, I suppose in some ways, I'm writing about that kind of transition I think we all, you know, it's, it's a trite thing to say because I think we all are, we all have to be really mm -hmm. writing about these times. But I'm very much interested in people who had a place in the world, had a very firm, tethered birth in the world, and that's just been suddenly, they've been cast adrift. And I'm looking at how they survive and how they interact with each other. Really, that's kind of, I think, what my kind of mission as a writer is, I suppose. Yes. Uh, Emmanuel, in your case, I guess there is this commonality that I mean you have, uh, you, first of all, you boast of your working class origin. You are both of working class origins and you, you know, it's, it's reproduced on your blurbs and so on. And uh, you talk about your, haunt, or your hometown or similar uh, aspects and obviously you even tackle this dissolution of community, the pursuit of self-interest, as we have seen maybe in your latest collection, uh, La Was Min, The Best of Times. Yeah, I think, uh, well, um, Irvine was mentioning uh, drugs and, and, you know, this, this uh, party culture, which he wrote so much about, and it was the same thing happening at those times, you know. Mm -hmm. We had the first, what they used to be called, the sin parties, you know. And uh, as for me personally, I had friends who, 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 who OD'd, so uh, I was very, you know, struck by what happened to those guys. I remember one guy in particular, we used to play football together when we were kids, and the last time I saw him before he he died of, uh, of overdose, was here at the, at the National Stadium. Uh, we were watching the match and uh, I went to pee and he was in the toilets believing that he is uh, supporting the team inside the toilet and oh. he was shouting and ranting and, and I said, Jesus, this guy, you know, he used to be my friend and mm -hmm. we used to play uh, football together and he was the best kid in town. And, you know, and, uh, and then shortly afterwards, uh, the news uh, was, and I wrote about this case, as you know, in Ultras, yes. in, the, in, the, in the book you published. So, and then besides this, there was the, the liberalization of almost everything. We were changing from a totally controlled economy to free market suddenly, and suddenly, uh, you had, you know, different radio stations, different TV stations, and all this happened in a very short period of time. I think this is very typical of us that, you know, radical changes happen rapidly here somehow. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you're almost taken aback even though you are all for these changes, but, you know, you, you have to somehow, uh, not to mention that at the same time also, uh, 
89 and, and the fall of, of the, of the wall and, and the communist regime. Mm -hmm. And I was very much interested and intrigued by what, what was happening there. So suddenly all these things were happening, you know, and you had to somehow record and register all this mm -hmm. in your writing somehow. This I, I know that not everyone agrees with me, and I think, Mark, you're one of those who disagree with me, but I'm very much, um, you know, I'm, I, I insist on myself to write the present, which I did in, in the best of times. Um, I, I hate this idea, which I find somewhat conservative. Some people believe that, listen, when something happens, you have to you know, think about it mm -hmm. and then let time pass and reflect on it and then maybe you write on it. I, I don't believe in such a thing. I have to write there and then about something which happened there and then, mm -hmm. you know? And I think this is something which is coming with us. Yeah. Um, I don't know. But yes. What's your take on writing the present, on, on chronicling the present? I mean, do you feel a sort of obligation as a writer to be there to, I mean, I mentioned in my notes, which I had you know, discussed, I mean, Ian McEwen, for example, who seems to read the daily paper, you know, and he sees that the subject of the day is global warming, robotics, Brexit, and so on, and writes a novel about it, you know, so he's, he's chronicled British history through his novels. Is there this obligation to recount the present and even also to have like in Emmanuel's case, for example, even the role of a public intellectual who's asked for opinions beyond his writings. Um, yeah, I mean, I try not to get too much into that. I try to kind of, um, I try to let the, let the story come to me, basically. And uh, I mean, I couldn't, um, I couldn't really, I, I tend not to jump into a theme or a subject, you know, whether it's, you know, sort of global warming or kind of, I mean, I don't wake up and think I've got to write something about COVID or global yeah. warming or um, you know sort of um, the 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 one percent or something like that. And uh, I'll kind of uh, you know it, it tends it tends to be either have an idea for a story or usually a character comes and forms in my head uh, and I let that character get on with telling the story or you know or put them in a room with another character. Uh, so it's, t it's a bit more organic um, in terms of um, I don't really I, I, I wait for the characters to tell me what the book's about, you mm -hmm. know. So it is. It tends to be letting the, the subconscious do the heavy work, basically, uh, and let you know. And um, I really I, I usually don't know what a book is about until I'm on about the third draft of it. Uh, and <laughs> I think, oh my God, it better be about something, you know. It's like that. Um, it's like, I think it was uh, Ray Bradbury, the American writer, who made this quote that um, you jump off a cliff and you hope that you've assembled these wings before you hit the bottom. And to me, that, that's about what writing's like. That's what the first draft of it is. It doesn't really, um, it is very rarely a, a kind of plan, basically. I'm just messing around and seeing what comes out and seeing what the plan, seeing what emerges. And do you think that history, um, current history, can be rapidly analysed, immediately analysed through literature? I think, I think it I has think that to was Emmanuel's point as I well. Mean, it has to now, but um, it's when you look at um, you look at the great the great visionary writers now that have stood the test of time are guys like Philip K. Dick, you know, the science fiction writers, because things are moving so quickly no. that it's very, very, you know, the, almost as soon as you imagine something it gets into the whole uh, technocratic and political spectrum, so it becomes part of the, part of the reality. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's the, 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 the real, in some ways, if there is a crisis in the novel, to use one of these kind of cliche terms, I think the crisis is about that, about keeping up, about trying to sort of, um, you know, about um, trying to sort of uh, think about what happens. And I, I find myself, more into contemporary issues than I used to be. And I think that's to do with age as well, because when I was younger, I had, um, you have the luxury of reflection and things, uh, things seem to move 
I'll, you know, it seemed then to move a lot slower. You know, now things move so quick. You don't really have that luxury. You have to kind of, I think, um, you have to shoot from the hip a little bit more. Yeah. You mentioned football. Um, that's another commonality. You, well, uncannily, both support hips. You support Hibernians, you support Hibernian, <laughs> black and white, white and green. Um, your team is slightly a bit more successful than Hibernian, but I know that much. We're, we're on top. Yeah. <laughs> um, Good on you. Football is, is very important in, in Irving's uh, work, definitely. Ultras had opened your seminal anthology, Saras Samut. And it's probably one of the few stories, I guess, in Maltese literature that uh, really tackled football and, I mean, this darker side of the game. Uh, obviously, football is a vehicle for class, politics, and even masculinity. And you guys both write intensively about men, masculinity, uh, even toxic masculinity. Um, and I recently was reading a short story by Irvin uh, about this guy who wants to, who's eager to see the Hibs Hearts match on TV. His wife wants to take him down to the pub. They go to the pub. Back, uh, back on the way home, a train slits her in half and they take the, her legs to the hospital to be stitched up. And still, he's still worried about the Hibs Hearts game. And he's disappointed that it finished in a nil, nil draw once again. And I must confess, I identified myself with the guy, you know, because football time is football time. But anyway, apart from that, um, w the importance of football in your lives, defining you even as, as a person, as a social being, you know, and even local football, you know, supporting your hometown, your region, and so on. And uh, how it's been emerged in your writing? Well, um, sadly, uh, as you mentioned, I, I, I have worked in class origins and uh, I talked about it quite a number of times, and I think it, is, it also shows in my, in my books. Um, but sadly, I miss many of my friends because we went, uh, you know, different directions. I mean, I went on to study, etc., etc. So, so I think I lost a lot of my working class, uh, you know. Connections. Uh, yeah, I did. And football was one of the very few uh, occasions where I met my friends again, and uh, you know we 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 renewed, and we we went over our memories and what have you. Even if we simply sat and watched and watched the match, you know, unlike other people, I don't visit the the town for the festa or what have you, as I'm I'm not religious, so I, I'm not interested in that kind of thing. But football meant also this, not to mention that in my, in my uh, experience, what happened was that I had a, a brother of mine who had emigrated to, to Australia and he came back and the first thing he, he did after, I don't know, 20 or 30 years abroad was, he told me, let's go to, to watch hips. And I said, okay, so this was something which, even on a very personal level, but you know, going, going to watch hips is, is much more than watching the match, you know, it's, there's, a whole, there's a whole story, there's a whole uh, drama, there's a whole narrative behind mm -hmm. watching the match, you know. Actually, the match, I wouldn't say it's the least important thing, but it's not the most important thing either, you know. Uh, Irv, in your case, you, I mean, you can tell us your experience, but recently got in a little pickle uh, because of a particular vicious comment as a pundit during a Hibs game, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe you can tell us about it, because... <laughs> I'm always getting... To, um, <coughs> I stumbled on it today, in fact. I, I mean, I can't even think of which one that would be. They come along, they come along so often. Um, yeah, I mean, um, the... Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's just as you said, it's a way of... Um, it's a way of keeping in touch with everybody, because people tend to um, disperse and they get into their own lives and stuff. But it is one place where you can, um, you know, you can have a, you can have like um, uh, a drug dealer, a lorry driver, a computer programmer, a teacher, and um, uh, all together. Uh, and, the, you know, the, the, and the, the, you know, they're all good mates and, the, you know, they, they hang out. Um, 
And to, I'm not actually that interested in the game so much now. I mean, it is more the social thing. It's more sort of, um, go, I mean, uh, the Hibs ground in Edinburgh, it's surrounded by different bars. Um, and it, oh, it's in a really old kind of working class neighborhood of tenement and buildings surrounded by different bars underneath them. Uh, and a couple of streets, big streets with kind of nice little cafes and restaurants on them. And it is a really great buzz to go there for the game. You know, the whole place is very vibrant and alive and a sort of, um, and, um, and it's just, you know, you go around a couple of bars, hook up with some old pals, have a bit of a laugh, um, go to the game. Um, that's usually a bit of a bummer. I mean, it's like, uh, it's a bit hit and miss with the football right now. Uh, and then you have a go afterwards for some food, more food and drink, and it's a, it's a fabulous day out, a really fabulous day out. I mean, um, I took my girlfriend to a game recently, and she'd never been to football before, never ever been to a football game uh, in her life, and she had this preconceived notion as to what it would be like. And she was just hooked. She thought, this is great fun. People are having a brilliant time here, you know, they're singing and dancing and drinking, and it's like, it's not like any other experience in the city on that day, you know? Um, but as I said, I mean, in 2019-16, in May 2019-16, Hibs won the Scottish Cup for the first time in 119 years. Um, we, were, we were cursed. And it was, and it, you know, they went on and the media went on that, you know, Buffalo Bill was still alive when Hibs won the, the Cup the last time and all this stuff. They do this every year, you know? And it was like, but, what happened was that by doing this and by rubbing it in for so long, they made it into the biggest party ever. You know, if Hibs won the Champions League six, seven years in a row, it wouldn't, it wouldn't even come close to rivaling that. You know, it was just a mad celebration that went on all summer. Um, you know, all the bars were showed the game uh, almost on repeat in Leith. So you go into a pub and you... You watch the game would be on there, and then you get to the last 20 minutes, and everybody would be glued again. And, like, <laughs> and this is about three, three or four months after the actual game, you know? So it just absolutely blew the community away. Um, and so it was a great thing, but also, sadly, football delivered everything for me then. It delivered every single thing that I ever wanted, like kind of um, a, a whole community galvanized and romance and joy and laughter and absolutely debauched hedonism and um, kind of introspective kind of philosophy that went on and on for, for months, basically. So the thing is, I'll never find, you know, I, I could never ever get that high um, from a football game again. Yeah. And it is the last bastion of community in a way. I mean, compared to what you were saying yesterday, where um, no subculture exists anymore, you know, because it goes straight to internet and then it's... it's yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, you know, you've, you've got these teams trying to form a Super League and yeah. break away, you know, and it's like, uh, I mean, the, as an industry, football as an industry is the most vicious, corrupt and horrendous neoliberal industry in the, um, on the planet, basically, like, you know, it's worth, it's up there with... Um, the big pharma <laughs> and up there, up there with, um, you know, sort of um, uh, the, the arms industry and all the other villains for its sheer uh, vicious exploitation of its, um, of its base of traditional supporters. Uh, going back to what happened way back, um, you mentioned that uh, you felt when you read Irvin, Niall and others, you felt that you had to talk, you had to write in a certain way. Um, I felt personally at the time that the voices that we were hearing from Irvin, for example, uh, unleashed a voice which we might not have used if the situation was different. It's as if these writings gave us a permission to speak and to speak in a certain way and to even if not revolutionized, but, but go against the grain of how, a, how a, I was going to say a supporter, but how a writer should have been, you know. Um, what, how do you explain this, this sort of switch, you know, which, which made, made a number of authors, such as you, such as Jose Estanio, for example, you know, 
maybe even change register because in this, I mean, you, you, your Sarasum Mut writings are similar to your previous work, but there is definitely a shift in subject matter, language, even in the audacity to write about certain subjects. Well, I think it, sooner or later it had to happen because, as I was saying, there were so many things happening, you know, mm -hmm. which uh, were seducing us to respond. I mean, there was no other way how to go about it. Now, reading Irvine and Nile and, and, and others made us uh, change not, not only what, what we were thinking and, and uh, feeling, but how to, how to narrate our thoughts and our feelings and our reaction to what was happening. But if it weren't for us, others would have done it sooner, so sooner or later. So I think it was a, a particular moment in time where so many things were happening, you know, uh, so many important things were happening. And we were feeling that, listen, change was in the air. Of course, then what happens later is that you you realize that it was all, you know, very, <laughs> very, I don't know. It was an, there was an element of illusion, but this always happens when there is this moment of change, you know. You get high on change and then basically you realize that it was all something up there which doesn't, doesn't really, really, uh, it, it's not really, a, what what one would really have wanted to happen mm -hmm. you know but the change was there and uh, yeah i think we found the language so to speak mm -hmm. and we dared to change the language in your case Irvin, did you feel that you were going against the grain or maybe breaking new ground or do you um or would you say you're even part I, of a tradition in some way yeah i mean i think uh, in some ways, both. I mean, it was like a lot of things that coalesced with me and where I was um, living and what I was doing. And uh, I think the the first one was that I did come from a tradition in Scotland whereby um, people were uh, very much interested in the duality of the, the country and the nation, and writers were very... Um, were used to, particularly in Glasgow, like Alistair Gray and James Kelman, were used to exploring um, kind of subject, strange subject matters or offbeat subject matters, and, off, and used to doing it in a kind of, um, in a certain way as well. Um, and that kind of, uh, also I think that was important for me at the time was that uh, I was also DJing, and I was getting into house music, and I was very, very energized by this new music of kind of, of acid house and I was raving and and, um, and I wanted to try to I wanted to try to, to write a book, a novel that would have that immediacy about it, you know. So in my early books, um train spotting to an extent, but also like uh, more acid house, Marabou's Thought Nightmares, Filth, I was using the vernacular as a kind of beat, it was like because it's like, it's a it's not an imperialist language, it's not a controller's language, so it's not a weights and measures and precision language. It's more about it's more funky. It's more about a beat, basically. So it's almost like a four-four beat. Mm -hmm. So that text was my four-four beat, um, and um, my uh, my text, all those mad typographical experiments that I was doing, they were my FX kind of above the four-four beat. So I was seeing it very musically. I was, you know, seeing it in a very kind of musical way. And I think that um, the Celtic uh, oral story tradition, because it's an oral tradition, it is very musical. You know, as it's not gen generally not written down, the you know the songs and ballads of that kind of folklore and all that. You know, so um, that was my kind of um, that was kind of the, the the second element, if you like. And I think the third element was that. I just happened to be up from Edinburgh, and um, I met all these people like uh, that that weren't from Edinburgh but were living there. Writers like um, Barry Graham was from Glasgow, like Duncan McLean was from Aberdeen, Kevin Williamson was was Thurso, um, Alan Warner was from Oban, Gordon Legg was from Falkirk, and we all happened to be not just in Edinburgh, but actually within a few blocks from each other. 
you know, sort of looking, hanging around some of the same places and putting on events that are kind of, um, I was putting on raves, Kevin Williamson started putting on raves with me. Um, we put on a club together and everybody came along to the club and then we put on poetry readings in the morning when people just wanted to chill out if they'd been up all night dancing, taking pills and all that. Uh, so the whole thing was being part of that, uh, which I didn't really think at the time was, was important, but in retrospect, that was very important that we generated a kind of scene, basically. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, uh, I, I think that it wasn't just the writers who changed their language at that time, but I think even journalists did. Mm. You know, yes. if you compare, for example, a very stupid thing like uh, uh, a court report from, say, the Times of 1985 and a similar court case and the report written in the Times, say, in 2000. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you notice, well, I think this is my impression, that even journalists were, you know, in their report, uh, they were becoming more graphic and uh, more explicit in what they reported and mm -hmm. also because it was the time when visual took over, you know, yes. so even when you write you had to be very visual in what you are writing. So I think it was not just the writers who changed their language at that mm -hmm. period of time, mm -hmm. but even journalists and, and, you know, people who were using language as their profession were changing the language. Talking about language and not only your experimentation, but your specific styles, which have left a mark in their respective literatures. Um, how do you think that your literature speaks to power or speaks truth to power? Um, uh, I mean, because the fact that you're even speaking in a new idiom, you know, which, which like I said, goes against the grain or uh, defies standards, even the fact that you use, you know, Scottish, and not English. There's a challenge, you know, to an established order. Um, do, do you feel that the tension with, with you know, something which is more established? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's great. Uh, it's nice to sort of, um, to have something to kick against. And there's one thing that um, the establishment in most countries gives you now, because they are, you know, they mean the, the, the purpose of every political organization and every institution that's left in the Western democracies is simply to funnel resources from the pockets of its citizens into the, the elites. That's, that's, what the, that's what it now exists to, uh, to do. There is, there's nothing else, basically. It's like, there's maybe a little bit of lip service to the community and we'll do this, we'll do that, but the main thrust of it is to kind of get everything and take it upwards. Um, and I think that's quite, in some ways, it's very, that, you know, that's obviously a, a kind of intolerable situation for most of us, but it's quite liberating in a way as well, because it means that um, you have a different relationship with the state. You have a relationship with the state where you don't really see it as a benevolent force, you know, as a, or a potentially benevolent force. You see it as a kind of um, something, you're, something you're either antagonistic with or something at, that at best doesn't really have anything to do with you anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. so, people start to, to build their own structures. They start to kind of, um, you know, they start to create their own culture, they create their own literature, they create their own recreation and entertainment. Um, they, they end up creating their own economy, basically, mm -hmm. you know, because everything is, um, everything is so removed from this corporate world as, as it becomes narrower and narrower in its focus. Um, and I think that um, the, it's not so much, um, it's not so much speaking the truth to power, because we've passed that. Power doesn't give a fuck, basically. You know, it's doing mm. its own thing. It's really kind of trying to tell the truth as you see it. And um, it, it's like um, to keep that basic flag of, um, of critical inquiry going on, on in the world, because now the, the way that the media is controlled, um, it's all about entertainment. We're all slaves to our algorithms and it's all about kind of quick fixes and quick dopamine smashes. And it's all in the interest of that kind of control mechanism. So uh, if, you, if you get the chance, if you get the privilege now, it is, for me, it is a privilege to be able to, to, to have a platform to tell your own truths. Um, and it hopefully resonates with a lot of people. 
then it's quite a it's quite a liberating thing. It's a, it's um, it's an enjoyable thing mm -hmm. to be in. Yeah. Yeah. In the best of times, you have tried to speak to power and about power, Emmanuel. Um, uh, I mean, you spoke to a, a defined power. You know, we know who it is. Um, how far do you feel that this literature has a resonance? I mean, if power doesn't give a shit or give a fuck, where, where, where do you stand as a writer who's, you know, trying to defy or open the eyes of this power? I think I stand nowhere, really. I mean, well, I, I stand nowhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you, you feel you think you I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm worrying the powers that be? <laughs> no, no, but but that's my point. I mean, okay, you don't. It's obvious that you're not going to worry the, worry the powers that be, and and, but I mean, when you wrote the best of times and you talked about specific uh, incidents and you fictionalized them and you used obviously the slogan of the Labour Party, yes. you know, it's yes. it was a it's a very ironic title. Um, where do you stand as an author in this? In no, this attempt was, of I, yours, maybe true writing to to say something. I'm not saying make a difference, change no, something. Definitely. Just to listen. I was very angry when the Labour Party, it wouldn't be anyone, came up with that slogan. You know, because it's you know it's it's a bit like choose life, maybe in a way. Uh, what, was yeah. the, what was the slogan? The Labour Party, well, the best of times. That we're living the best of times. Right. You know, choose life by TV and all that. So. The best of <laughs> Yeah, that's it. You know. I like the style. Yeah. Um, you, you, you can't really accept anyone telling you that we are living in the best of times. How can you? Mm -hmm. it, it, it really pissed me off, to be honest. You know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, this, this very American style of doing politics and, and of was this a recent slogan, yeah? Yes, yes. Uh, what, seven years ago? Yeah. yeah. Ten years right. ago? I don't know. Before we had face masks. Yeah, yeah exactly. Before we wore masks. <laughs> a, a, a global pandemic, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, another question I would like to ask, particularly Irvin, but I mean, it concerns any author. You've all got your preoccupations, your obsessions, which manifest themselves in recurrent characters, recurrent themes and so on. And uh, in your case, you know, I, I love most of your books, but less the ones which are with train-spotting characters in them for some reason, you know, which I call the train-spotting franchise. So there's a uh, novel, two movies, prequel, sequel, and, and all that. Uh, first of all, my curiosity is how much of that is industry-led, industry-driven? And I mean, would you, do you fall in a trap where I'll, Okay, you know, Begbie's gonna sell for sure. And yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, let's talk about this first, and then I'll, I'll proceed with with the, with the segue to the question. Um, yeah, I would I would love to say it was um, the industry and they've compelled me into doing this yeah. and all this sort of stuff. But actually, what it is it's like um, it's almost like if you think about something you want to address, um, you. Uh, you look what's inside the toolbox, you know, for the, which characters are there, you know, they're the kind of tools that will help you tell the story and you might have to sort of um, sharpen them up or whatever, but, um, and sometimes they gate crash as well. You don't realize that you're writing a character from mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. book. I mean, when I wrote Porno, I wrote the character, I, I, the character had a different name from Sick Boy. He was just the, um, the character Nicky's boyfriend, you know, he wasn't, and I, th I realized when I got into it, the first draft, that this is sick boy, you know, yeah, it yeah. just is, and he's, because, and he is the best person to tell that story, that's what, exactly what he would be doing now, so if you tell that history, then, then it be, you have to tell the rest of the story and all that, you know, so there is a, <coughs> there's an element of that, and there's also, with Dead Men's Trousers, which was kind of the third one in the, that series, um, it was a it was a product of working on the T2 porno um, transporting two film uh, with Danny and um, Andrew and John. Um, we were all basically locked up in a room for well, you know, like a Big Brother house for two weeks trying to come up with a script idea. And I just kind of when I had so much in my head from there, 
I just thought, God, I've got enough for another book. You've got all these ideas I want to, to get down. But they are actually a joy to come back to old characters. They're really great fun to write. Um, the big thing you have to avoid doing is um, making sure that the pleasure is not all yours. You know, yeah. they're actually saying something, they're telling a, a contemporary story that's interesting. Um, but, I've, you know, I have nothing but respect for writers who can, who, who can write the same character in every book and just come up with a new story for mm -hmm. them. You know, it, it's kind of implausible nonsense, really, but um, it is actually, uh, it's like, um, it's kind of pure storytelling rather than, so, you know, and I'm much more orientated towards character mm -hmm. than story. I, I, I kind of, as I said before, I kind of let the character try to come up with the story. And these characters are people you like, unlike the bent cop in Filth, for example. These, these characters are the ones... Yeah, I mean, I think you don't have to like characters. I think the most important thing is that you, you feel challenged by them in some way. You know, I, I, like, I don't like... Um, I like characters that don't give me an easy time. You know, I don't really want an easy time when I'm writing. I want, I want to be pushed and to be, to be challenged. Mm -hmm. In your case, Emmanuel, something I just, I might have talked to you about or wrote about, uh, you also had your obsessions, your preoccupations. You know, I had said that you, that there was a time, you know, when I said, oh, another vintage Emmanuel Mifsud book, which talks about whores, junkies, closet gays, etc., etc. Yeah. And then you went on and wrote a novel in the name of Father and of the Son, which was a total... Is, um, is there a moment uh, where... Is there a tipping point, maybe, where authors feel that they've exhausted a certain arsenal and they have to, you know, move on into the, a new direction? Did that happen to you, or, or was it...? Uh... Well, in my case, it was Mark Vella who put me in this situation. But <laughs> one day, I, I don't know, we were at your place or at mine, and you told me, Listen, stop it with, with all these dropouts and junkies <laughs> and everything. I mean, and, and, and at that point I said, you know, I'm, uh, I'm rehashing myself and yeah. this is something I really didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what I was going to do instead, you know. And then, as the story many people know, I find this blessed uh, di war diary and that's when the name of the father. Mm -hmm. But I was scared, scared shit, you know, I mean, I said, how would people react to this book when it's so different from what I've yes. written before? Yes. But, uh, you know, it was you who was responsible for this, in my case. And <laughs> I, I thank you for this. Did the same thing happen with the sex lives of, of Siamese twins? Um, it's funny because I, I think if anybody here, was here last night, I apologize because I'm going to tell the same stories again as I told last night. Um, <clears throat> you think you've kind of exhausted all the biographical elements of your characters by the time you get there. And I wrote this book called The Sex Life of Siamese Twins and the narrators were two young American women. Uh, and I'm not a young American woman, basically. And um, I'd, I'd written the book, the first draft of it, <coughs> and I, I thought I'll give it to my wife to read, who was a young American woman. Um, and I thought at least nobody's gonna say that I'm like these two characters. And she read it and she said, those two characters are more like you than any characters you've ever written before. And I think probably because I, I kind of I had, my, I had my defenses down in a way because I, I didn't think that um, they would be like me in any way. But they actually were, you know. So there's a strange thing that happens when you, I think when you write, when you write character, particularly when you write in first person, that... Um, a very kind of um, strange alchemy kind of imposes itself, and um, you just uh, you you um, you seem to have created something that's very different. But actually, in a lot of ways, it probably isn't that different. Yeah? Mm. But in Sex Lives of Siamese Twins, maybe you have. Uh, I'm very curious about this book because it, I, I I rediscovered you, you know after after, after the train spotting years. Um, you seem to have tried something different in the sense of not only setting and, I mean, it's in the USA and so on, but even the characters, although they're vintage Welsh, you know, they've got a very particular identity of their own. Uh, the, the gym instructor, you know, the, the fatty and, 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 and the relationship together, you know, gets, it's, 
It was a strange one for me to do because actually I wrote it when I was living in America, um, mainly in Chicago, but also in Miami. Uh, and um, <clears throat> because it was, because um, it's an American book, uh, I was getting kind of asked, and because it's a book about women, and it's about, it's ostensibly about kind of weight and dieting and all that, and that's, you know, and food, and Americans are kind of obsessed with all that. So we get asked on to all these morning shows, you know, all these daft kind of like, good morning America, kind of like, you know, you've got the, the Texas one and the, the New York one and the California one. And <clears throat> it was like um, the, the woman who was a kind of psycho character in it, Lucy, um, who was trying to starve the other person, the other woman to death, basically to, to, to lose all this weight. Uh, it really depended on who the presenter was. You know, if it was mm. a kind of, um, if it was a sort of mumsy, sort of uh, kind of middle-aged woman, they would, you know, they'd be, they would be like, um, oh, that is terrible. This Lucy's a horrible character. She's a psychopath. And if it was one, if it was a, a real kind of, um, kind of actress, kind of supermodel, bimbo, kind of young TV presenter, and the kind of, the you know, the heels and and um, stockings and all that, it would be like a, you can see her pine. She just wants to make America better. You know, you know. So you think this is great. You know, <laughs> so, uh, it it was. Um, it it kind of really did well in America. Not so much in Britain. Mm -hmm. Uh, carrying on with characters, I think we can objectively say that you write about ugly people. Emmanuel's first ever co short story collection is called Stories of Ugly People. Um, Emmanuel writes, I guess, with a certain classic realism, with a certain empathy, you know, looking at these people and using them even as maybe vehicles for a social theme. Uh, in your case, are these ugly people who would, uh, you know, even irritate, you know, a, a standard bourgeois sensibility, but you can even root for them and like them, you know, like I like the guy who, who, who lets his wife, you know, nearly die under a train because he wants to see what's the match. Now, I mean, <laughs> I'd like you to talk about your, your, your fascination, you know, with this, with this object of ugliness. Yeah, but even, I, don't, I don't really yeah. see it in that way. I mean, I think it's like... Um, what you do is you can you. To me, it's just people who are um, <clears throat> who are in a position whereby they're um, we're, we're all in the same position. We're all trying to find out how we become the best possible version of ourselves in this short life that we've got. And it's like um, I think what I try to do is I, I try to get. Um, people who are a bit fucked up in a certain way, and we all are fucked up in certain ways, but put them in a room with someone else who's fucked up in a different way and see what kind of drama they can provide. And as far as I, I can say, you can, you can have the, the, most, the darkest, most fucked up character and the, the, darkest, most, the, the darkest story, provided the character is actually making an effort, provided they're going for the light switch, they're, they're groping yeah. around in the yeah, dark yeah. trying to find the light switch, and that's what I always try to do. I always try to make sure that they're that um, they're not just looking for not so much looking for the light the light switch, but there's consequences for them on their behaviour. I mean, I can you know I don't mind writing a, a character who's racist and misogynistic and vile in all sorts of ways, provided you show the consequences of that on them and their life and the lives of the people around them. I think that's where the kind of moral imperative. Of, um, the, if there is a moral imperative of a novelist, I don't know if there is, but I think that's where it comes in to show the consequences of of the the behaviour on the the broader community. So I don't see it as about being. Um, I see it as about people who've had a, who've been in a, in, in a circumstance where the, their choices are very limited, mm. where their okay. social ammunition is very limited, and they're trying to to forge a path with. Um, with, with that limited social ammunition, they're not in a, a social milieu which has kind of um, been able to develop their talents um, to the best ways in the mainstream society, but they have to go with what they got, you know? You don't see a risk of having the novel become like a sort of uh, vicarious way of living, of living, you know, the, the, 
living vice and the fast life, you know, without uh, <laughs> without leaving the comfort of your. I mean, I I, I recount that when I, I watched I mean, Fame Spotting, I, I was too tough. But life. I was. I mean, it's like um, it's not a it's not a glamorous life that most of the characters mm -hmm. are right live, and yeah. it's not something you would really aspire to. Um, I think in some ways it's like. Um, if it is, it's not really living vicariously, it's living by caution. I think it's more of a cautionary tale to myself. Nice. Like, you know, stand back from this, otherwise you, this is what's going to happen to you, basically. And you're ugly people, Emmanuel. Well, I, I love my ugly people and I very much uh, detest my beautiful, sexy ones, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. What's his name? Eric Sherry, someone I can't, you know, I, I can't accept that, that, that I wrote this, this character, you yeah. know, because I, you know, did that. Mm -hmm. So I have this empathy with the, with ugliness, you know. Yesterday, uh, everyone was talking about the pose, you know, and uh, one thing that I'm so much drawn to pose is this morose, uh, as you were describing, when they are on the streets, but then once they go indoors, they are different people. I prefer the outdoors version. <laughs> <of people. laughs> um, the last question, because we're nearly, um, the time is nearly up. In an afterword of one of your short story collections, uh, you talk about Cowden Beat, I guess, and you say that, you know, um, uh, in, I mean, the people I'm talking about are the fruit of my imagination because we live in a wee country with a great spirit, however, you know, in brackets. And uh, I do believe that in a way, you know, this, this, this spirit thing, whatever it may be. And we're also a wee country, you know, but I guess we have a certain spirit, which I mean, I don't know. I don't want to hazard uh, an opinion, but I guess we've got more spirit than Andorra, San Marino, you know, or, or small countries like that. What is the spirit of a we country? And, and how we do you feel? <laughs> I mean, is it because of, you know, I'm your neighbor thinking, downstairs who's just... No, I mean, I always think of Scotland as a big country. Um, because, uh, I mean, I lived in America for years. And I don't think of America as a big country because you jump on a plane and fly over it. You know, it's like, um, and um, when you go, when you go on a, when you do a road trip in America, it feels like nothing changes for a long, long time. So it's, it's change that kind of delineates a country. Whereas Scotland's smaller, but it's kind of very small comparison, but it's very dramatic, the changes. You know, I was up at a wedding in Sky last weekend, and it was like, you step outside, you mean I'm in, from the industrial belt between Glasgow and Edinburgh, and that's where most of the Scottish population is, basically. Um, then you go outside of that and it's just a complete wilderness and you can't, you know, we, we, we drove 200 miles to sky, but all these winding roads and it felt like you were, it felt like driving for mile for days in America. You just felt the same way. So a kind of, um, and also as a kid, when you see, you know, distances are bigger and things are bigger when you're a kid, that um, a perceptually think of Scotland, I experience Scotland as a big country, as a really big place, mm -hmm. a big wild place, like, you know, whereas I don't really have America, because I've, I've, I've kind of gone to America at a later point in life, and my perception of it is very business, it's very New York, LA, I'm living down in Miami, I'm stopping off at home in Chicago, but I'm basically on this belt, and then you're at an airport, and you get a Uber to where you're going, and everything is pretty much of a muchness in a way, you know, everything is, there's a, there's a well-worn path of travel, basically, where, um, whereas in Scotland, I tend to get, when I'm there, I, I tend to vanish and get off the beaten track a bit more, you know? The really last question, <coughs> you are frequently called the voices of a generation. Is it a label that you are comfortable with? Uh, and do you feel that you have really talked about something important which has a resonance, has a legacy? No, I, I don't think I am the voice of a generation. I'm one voice out of many, but not the voice of a generation. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, you can't really think about things in these terms because I think as a, as a writer, um, you don't really, the impact of it is, is nothing to do with you. I mean, I think that when you write a book, it's an act of giving away. You know, you're giving something away and um, it's not really yours anymore. So it's not really what happens to that and what kind of a claim that you get or don't get or criticism and all. It's not really anything to do with you. And the other thing is, is like, for me, I'm always moving on to the next book and I'm immersed in that and that's taken all my energies. So I'm not really, I'm not really hanging out in that critical discourse until we do little things like this and then you're reminded that that kind of exists. But otherwise, I wouldn't really know anything about it. Yeah. Irvin, Emmanuel, thank you very much. Thanks. So, uh, there seems to be time for questions from the floor. Wrong ground with the mic. Okay, there seems to be time for questions from the floor, right, Simona? Uh, we'll be going around with the mic. So, there's a question from the gentleman there. Hi, um, thank you, first of all, for being here. First of all, I read that you worked with the Hackney Local Council, and I've been to Hackney, and I actually saw a Dub House concert in reggae with so many multicultural uh, society, including seeing people with Rottweiler and underwear in the audience. How, mu how much did you draw from the Hackney people while you were working there to influence you in the writing? And secondly, being an avid Hibernian fan, and obviously um, so proud of being Scottish. Have you met or have you been influenced by Tom Farmer, who has saved hips many times, and also Hamish Henderson, who has worked so much that he, he was even banned by BBC for having collected so many anthropological works about Scotland? Thank you. Ray, um, I think that... I mean, I, I, there was a bit echoey there, but uh, was it something about the, the I know, the, I got the Tom Farmer bit and how much he's influenced, how much I've been influenced by Tom Farmer. Um, in terms of life and work, not at all, but I have met him and he's a, a very nice guy and I'm grateful to him for his role in saving heads. Um, I think the other one was, was that about Hackney Council? Did I hear? about working for Hackney Council. Yeah, I mean, um, and, the, and I think that certainly any job that I've had um, has been much more, it's, it's always been an education. I think you, you know, particularly jobs that you have when you're younger, and I was younger uh, when I worked there. Uh, these, these things really stay with you, the people that you meet, and uh, the, um, the, the, you know, the, I think everything is like um, every every job you do, when you particularly when you're younger, it's got this, the social element is so important. The people that you're mixing with and meeting for the first time, <coughs> and I think yeah, I mean I think that um, working uh, Hackney was quite a poor borough back then. It's not now. It's very uh, it's very gentrified, but it was quite a down at heel place at the time. So yes, I think definitely it's obviously had some kind of an influence. Any other questions? Okay, we've got... Uh, when, you re when you read the blurbs of your books, and uh, uh, there, uh, there's always a focus on, you know, the, the dark and gritty, you know, realist side, and uh, um, when, when I read them, I, f uh, I definitely feel that, but I also feel that there's a, 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 a love in there. Like, a, um, I feel like the characters, um, I feel like you psychologically understand people, like on a, on a very deep level. Um, uh, even when you're writing about characters, you know, um, who do very, uh, um, reprehensible things, you know, there's always a sort of uh, something redeemable. Is that, is that something you intend to do or is that something I read in them out of some kind of optimism on my part? Or 
Yeah, I mean, I don't really think it's it's up to me to judge the characters. You know, I mean, I think that, um, but you have to show that. Um, I think that everybody, every character you write, you have to do it. Not not necessarily um, a sort of um, uh, an endorsement of the behaviour of the character, but I think you have to show a genuine love of humanity that kind of that comes through because. The, you know, the, there is a, there's a, there's a thing about um, even the very, even the very worst person can do good things, and even you know, the, even the very best person can do terrible things. So you have to see. I think you have to see writing in that context when you're working on characters. Thank you. Um, thank you for the talk, all three of you. It was really interesting. Um, where would you say you write? Um, where's your favorite place to write from? Or how do you, what's your preferred place to write from? Um, home or a cafe or a specific country? Or just curious. Sorry, was that a, a play, what place? Yes. Uh -huh. Right, where, 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 where would I prefer to write? Physically? Yes, uh -huh. where do you write? Um, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate and I can write anywhere. Uh, I mean, I write on buses and in cafes and sort of, um, <clears throat> you know, on a train at a bus stop. Uh, and I, you know, I'm just, I, I don't really need to settle down in an office in a, you know, in a certain place or there's got to be a certain view out the window or I've got to be in a certain kind of country or town or whatever. I can just pretty much do it everywhere. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I kind of, I mean, I've, I've gone through, in the past, I've kind of got a big office with a beautiful balcony view and all that, and every, had everything that I needed to do that. And I would just end up in the local cafe, kind of crashed into a, crumped, cramped into a corner and scribbling away. Um, it's like, um, I always feel when I've got, and I, I like a nice big office and all that, it's quite show-offy, but I never really write there because it always feels it always feels too much like a proper job. Um, because of when I started writing, I had proper jobs and I was kind of skiving, basically taking time off work and so everything was very spidery, clandestine writing. And I associate that with kind of play and having fun and stealing time. Whereas I associate a big desk and office with being at work really and it's not quite as fun for me. So um, I don't really need to write anywhere. And I think that's, uh, very fortunate thing to have, you know. You, I, I don't want to get into ever to get into the mentality that everything has to be just so before I can sit down and go for it. Any other questions? <clears throat> Sorry, it's me again. Uh, just, just to remain, because I'm curious. How do you write, Emmanuel? Uh, What's your, uh, are you a, a writer who likes to be in one place and whatever, or I'm, well, you are a bit of a scribbler, right? I mean, to, uh, well, usually I, I write in my room at home. Yeah. But train stations are also a very good place where to write. So, uh, the busier, the better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, you just said, Irvine, that even the worst of uh, people can do good things. Um, and the Burgess have tried to explore the human being's ability to reinvent himself or clean himself from evil in, um, in a clockwork orange. And you have tried to change Franco Begbie into something else. It became the blade artist, but it still shows his old traits. And eventually, he's feels sort of rested if he's killing people, even in that man's trousers. Um, you as a person, how do you stand on uh, the issue of whether a uh, human being can be innately evil or whether he does have a chance for uh, reintegration, for rehabilitation? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of... Um I mean, there's some great exploits. The novel you mentioned there, Clockwork Orange, for example, is some great explorations of um, kind of um, human nature and evil and all these kind of concepts. I mean, I just feel that basically we're, you know, it's like, um, it's kind of greed, selfish, and stupidity that fuck us up rather than necessarily evil, you know? 
I don't, I mean, I think that um, I'm not sure that evil exists as an absolute in that kind of, um, in that sort of religious way. I don't really kind of sort of, it doesn't really seem to be consistent with what I've found in life. Um, and uh, I think there's always a sort of, um, there's always causation in behavior, even the very worst sort of kind of behavior. Um, I think that's what, what you, that's the exciting thing to discover as a novelist, you know, if it's like, uh, if it is just this kind of evil character or this kind of uh, monstrous character, then it loses a bit of uh, connection with humanity. It loses a bit of, um, a bit of that kind of human emotional resonance that we can invest in something. Uh, the, the TV show I've got coming out in a couple of weeks' time is like, uh, we, push, <coughs> we push that envelope out as far as we can <coughs> with regards to an evil character, but we're still trying to deconstruct that character as well in terms of what's going on in their life to make them behave in that way. Hi, Irvan. Um, I have a question out of more, more of, out of curiosity uh, more than anything. The aspect of feminism in your books, that's your character, even, that, even though your majority of characters are, are, are males, right? There is a huge sense of feminism, especially, and I always felt it this way, in Filth and, and Mary Bustock Nightmares. Uh, how shall I put it? The, the fact that, that even, <coughs> even though it might come across at times as misogynistic, right? Um, feminism trumps up and, and, he, and he kind of wins over, over all these dark, dark characters, etc. I mean, is there, is there a sense that you feel that the female voice is still there even though there are male characters? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you, you know, the um, one of the one of the reasons that I don't have in the uh, in books like, say, Train Spotting and Filth, I don't have a lot of um, powerful women characters in them, is because any powerful woman character wouldn't want anything to do with guys like that. You know, the, the, they'd be run, You know, so you have to be, you have to kind of take that social reality into account. Um, most of the, the best feedback I have. Um, from the books tends to come from women and tends to come from feminists because they'll they'll say like for fuck's sake I went out with a, a guy like that before like you know so everybody's you know like every guy kind of um, knows uh, you know the, the characters well in the first book for example the the four main characters are archetypes you know you've got the the cynical intellectual the lovable loser the violent psychopath and the manipulator um, and Neither of these characters are really that great for a woman to go out with. So, and most women have gone out with one or the other. So they'll tell you exactly kind of um, that sort of um, the resonance about it. But I mean, it's like, um, it's, you know, I mean, what, what I, when I wrote so, uh, a, a book that was about, mainly about women characters like uh, Sex Lives of Siamese Twins or the, the Wedding Bells film, which hasn't been widely shown, but it's a very good film, I think, uh, which is basically a girl gang. Um, the, uh, the, there's, when you, you, women can be as crazy in their own way as guys can. You know, it's just different, um, it's sanctioned in a different social way, but it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of material, a lot of really great material, abundant material about relationships between women in the same way as there is relationships between guys. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I guess, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I compliment you also for your sense of hearing because you didn't miss a beat, despite the echo. While Emmanuel and myself suffered, it seems. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and once again, thank you to the National Book Council for organizing. Thank you, Irvin. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, guys. <laughs>